Again, I'm Jeremy Long um, at CTXT on Twitter, uh, if you so care. Um, here's talking about software composition analysis with a loss dependency check. Uh, I do like that I got a, re a reference in the uh, previous talk on the OWASP.10, how they uh, used my tool to do some analysis. Uh, that, that was that was kind of kind of interesting. Uh, I'm always surprised at how and where dependency check gets used. Um, so I hope software composition analysis in this day and age uh, doesn't need to be explained. When I started dependency check, uh, it absolutely did. But this is the obligatory slide. Uh, basically, we're identifying potential areas of risk from the use of third-party commercial and open source components. Very uh, simply stated, uh, primary risks are legal risk and known uh, published or public vulnerabilities. Uh, dependency check itself doesn't do a whole lot for the legal risk. It will report what the license is if it identifies it. Um, but that is not its primary purpose, at not even a little bit. Uh, so it is primarily trying to identify known vulnerable known vulnerabilities within your project's dependencies. Um, as we're here uh, with the 20th anniversary of OWASP, I realized as I was looking at this deck, putting it together, that dependency check is about 10 years old now. I started writing it November 2011. Um, before software composition analysis was even a known term. Uh, I think the first paper was The Unfortunate Realities of Insecure Software by Jeff Williams um, uh, in April. And dependency check out our first release mid-2012. And since then, we've seen an explosion of SCA tools on the market. Uh, people not doing SCA correctly has been the... Uh, uh, cause of several breaches that have happened uh, and and even getting to the point of with the uh, 2021 executive order to improve cybersecurity and that explicitly referenced uh, some of the supply chain risks um, that software composition analysis helps to uh, mitigate. Uh, so again, I, I like to give a little overview of our journey with independency check. Uh, when I first wrote it back, started writing it, it was really focused just on Java. Um, and the community, after they saw what I had done for Java, started contributing back .NET, uh, Ruby, Node, Python. A lot of other language support was contributed um, from, from pull requests. Uh, I do want to point out, even though some of these uh, integrations or supported languages have been around and in use with independency check, not all of them are equal. Um, some of them are still are listed as experimental analyzers. Uh, we're hoping when we have time, uh, we can try and finish them off and polish them a little bit more to take them out of that experimental status. Uh, but with the experimental analyzers, uh, you're still getting results, but you may have a slightly higher false negative and false positive rates. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, in the uh, in the talk. But one of the things with dependency check is for some of these experimental analyzers, uh, we wanted you to knowingly have to turn these on by enabling the uh, experimental flag when you run dependency check. Uh, we also wrap some other tools like bundler audit if you're doing Ruby, uh, retire JS, we use their client side, uh, JavaScript scanning technology, um, NPM audit for some of the node and yarn projects, and OSS index. Huge fan of OSS Index. Uh, Sonatype, after purchasing the OSS Index, actually uh, contributed the OSS Index Analyzer to the Dependency Check project. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a slide or two. Um, as we continue down the journey, uh, not only did we expand on our uh, languages and technologies that we supported, but we also expanded um, into, you know, we had Maven and Gradle and Lean and SBT um, and other integrations like Azure DevOps, uh, Jenkins, SonarCube. Uh, we of course have our CLI and the Docker images um, as well. Um, there's four of these that are Astra and those are the actual build tools. I can't stress enough, if you're using dependency check, do everything you can to use one of these four integrations. Um, if, you, if you're scanning uh, you know, a Maven or a Gradle project, use the Maven or Gradle plugin. Don't use the Docker image or the command line integration. Um, there's 
many benefits. Uh, we actually get more information when we're doing the analysis uh, if we're actually using the Maven, uh, if we're actually using a build plugin, because we can actually get information from the build. It's not just uh, what we can find from the files on disk. I've actually uh, had conversations with people who tried to use Docker or CLI to scan a Maven project, but they never ran a, a build or copy dependencies. And so there was no there was nothing for dependency check to analyze and they found zero results when they used the CLI uh, because it was uh, a security analyst who wasn't really a developer trying to run this. So uh, if at all possible, work with your development teams when, when working, when integrating this, work with your build pipeline people, or your, your, your pipeline uh, folks uh, to get this integrated correctly into, into the build environments. Um, that being said, uh, let's talk about where we are today. Uh, it's a flag flagship project. Uh, I still can't believe how many people are actually using dependency check. Uh, we used to host a lot of the um, like command line tool and the AND plugin on Bintray, but that was shut down May May first, twenty twenty one. And if we just since we started publishing things to the GitHub releases, since that migration from Bintray to GitHub, we already have a million downloads of the, of the command line uh, tool. Um, we've got two and a half million pulls of the Docker image. Uh, just in August alone, the Maven and Gradle plugins have 200,000, 250,000 downloads. It, this tool is being heavily used and I'm glad people have found the, our work uh, useful. Um, how we actually, uh, uh, get work is that we use uh, our primary data sources are the NVD. Um, really want to talk about the NVD because recently they've started adding um, uh, what I'm almost might call abuse filtering um, or, or rate limiting because uh, if you try and download one of the uh, uh, JSON data feeds from NIST, and then you immediately try and download it again, that second download is probably going to hang or just fail uh, because, uh, you know, they have to protect their bandwidth and, and whatnot, and not rightfully so. Uh, the way dependency check works by default is it caches the NVD data locally in an H2 database. It creates a little data directory and, and keeps a cache of that. One of the things that I've talked to some people about is that some of, some of the are using more of an ephemeral build environment when they're running dependency check and they're just throwing away that data directory and just not caring. And the next time they spin up a new image and they try and download the NVD and they're running into problems because they can't, uh, the NVD ends up blocking them because they can't, and they can't download it again. Um, so there's a couple of ways around that, figure out how to cache that data directory. That would be one, highly recommend that. Um, or consider setting up an, uh, a mirror of the NVD. That's also um, huge uh, help to ensure reliability of the dependency check project in your organization. Um, with that, uh, we also use the OSS index, as I said. Um, that actually identifies vulnerabilities that are not in the NVD. Uh, but I do wanna point out uh, that when you're using the OSS index, uh, all of the um, uh, package URLs, all of the, the information about that dependency check uh, collects about your dependencies, that list is sent to the OSS index for analysis. Um, some people don't like that. They wanna keep that a little bit more private um, and that's fine, but then they will lose out on being able to uh, get any of the vulnerabilities that aren't, that, that are in the OSS index that are not in the NVD. Um, and as I've mentioned, we also use uh, NPM audit uh, and that is used for both YARN and, and, and Node.js analysis with NPM. Uh, and again, similar data as with OSS index is sent to uh, the um, NPM. Um, and then as uh, mentioned earlier, we also use data from bundle audit and retire JS. But in those cases, that data is just pulled down locally and, and used um, locally. We're not sending any information out. So once we have all that data to do our 
analysis with, how, do, how does dependency check actually work? Well, uh, we keep a local copy of the NVD um, and that has the common vulnerability and exposures. Uh, and every CVE has a description, a CVSS score, and a list of the common platform enumeration, um, the CPE, the software that is uh, known to be, that, that is vulnerable to that, to, to that CVE. One of the things I always like to talk about when we're, when we're looking at the CVE data is, one, this is public data. Um, this is for the blue team and the attackers. It's, you know, once, once a CVE is published, even the bad guys know about it. Uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, from Prime Faces. A few years ago, a remote code execution vulnerability, uh, a CVE was published. It was published like uh, January uh, or December. I, I forget the exact time frame. The vulnerability was actually uh, discussed and in, in a GitHub issue patched like two or three years earlier prior to that CVE being published. But eventually some, somebody realized that and said, hey, there's a CVE on these versions of, of, of Prime Faces. And because that CVE had never been published, nobody upgraded. And so as soon as we had a remote code execution CVE, um, Bitcoin miners started popping Prime Faces sites and putting miners on their servers. Uh, and so this is one of the reasons why you want to kind of pay attention to at least at a minimum what hits the NVD, because once it hits the NVD, it's public. And that's been the cause of uh, several data breaches because people weren't doing SCA properly. They weren't monitoring everything. And that's where, uh, why we have some of that uh, executive orders on supply chain and the S and the discussions of SBOM, uh, you know, dependency track, Steve's tool, I believe he has a talk in, in this track as well. I don't remember if he's given it already or not, but uh, dependency track is another great tool to help solve this problem. Uh, so one of the big things that dependency check is, uh, or does is library identification. Um, because if you don't correctly identify the library, there's no way to report on it. And well, that's actually more challenging than it sounds because development and security don't speak the same language. We use different identifiers. Development, like for, for the Spring Framework, this is kind of an old version of the Spring Framework, uh, but it, it illustrates a, a problem with the naming that we have. Uh, development, even when this had become, becomes a modern version of Spring, like a recent release, you know, five, six, I don't even remember what version Spring the Spring Framework is on, they're still gonna use org Spring Framework Spring Core, Spring Web, Spring Boot. It's all, you know, the same group artifact version. However, security, we use the CPEs and we're really big about, you know, blaming the vendor because a CPE is vendor product version. It goes, it, it's a little bit bigger than that, but vendor product version is, is, is you know, the, the main CPE. Um, and so for the same version, that we have a single coordinate from development. We had three at one time, different CPEs. And, you know, there's no comprehensive, you know, mapping between these two things. And so any SCA tool has to come up with a way of how do we identify uh, our the, the dependencies so that we can report on vulnerabilities. Um, in this case, Spring Source was bought by VMware. And there, for some versions, uh, for some versions of the Spring Framework, you'll actually see VMware Spring Source Spring Framework as well. Uh, so there's Pivotal, Pivotal Software, Spring Source, and VMware as all vendors for certain versions of the Spring Framework um, for certain CVs. I actually think the the Pivotal and Pivotal Software. I, I do believe that has actually been cleaned up and they've corrected it just to be pivotal on both of them, uh, as opposed to having two uh, vendors, uh, one being pivotal and one being pivotal software. But it still, it shows the problem that because we're looking at the vendor and not what the developer calls it, it's difficult to do that identification sometimes. So 
how does dependency check actually accomplish this? We use what we call uh, evidence-based identification. Uh, basically, we extract as much textual information as we can from the uh, DLL, JAR file, the build system. You know, if we're integrating with the build system, we try and extract as much textual information as we can about every dependency. And we bu bucket that into vendor product version collections. And we kind of classify them as this is high confidence, low confidence um, evidence. And then uh, we create a leucine index. Uh, that's a, a great text searching engine that you can index a, a ton of data. I think it's funny that we're using it to index two fields as opposed to like the Library of Congress, like it's kind of intended to be. So we're kind of using it in a little inverse uh, of its intended use case, but it works really well. Um, we built some specialized analyzers that help with the uh, with looking things up in the index. But basically we take all of that evidence and query the index to identify the common platform enumeration for every, any given dependency. And then based on that, we're able to then uh, look up the vulnerabilities in the NVD data. So obviously one of the problems are false positives. Uh, sometimes evidence extracted from a dependency can point dependency check at the wrong common platform enumeration. It happens. Um, we'll, we'll talk about how to deal with that in a second. The other is false negatives. Uh, and that's sometimes when there's not enough information uh, in the dependency to map back to that CPE. One of the key examples is what I was just pointing uh, back with the Spring Framework, Pivotal. On, that, on those versions of Spring Framework, there was no mention of the word Pivotal anywhere in the POM, the manifest, the file name, there was no mention of Pivotal. Um, and so, uh, we have we have ways of dealing with both of these situations uh, with independency check. Uh, most users only deal with false positives. They end up reporting the false negatives back to uh, the core team, and we end up correcting those using uh, a hints file. Uh, however, if you get the HTML report, it is extremely easy to go through, analyze things. If you're familiar, it's easy if you're familiar with uh, the technology stack that's being used and the types of dependencies that are in that uh, technology stack. If you're trying to analyze, you know, a technology stack that you're not as familiar with, it may be a little bit more difficult sometimes to de determine if something is a false positive or not. But using the HTML report, there are these little suppress buttons and basically you can just copy and paste to generate this suppression file. Um, and you can knock out all of your false positives uh, really, really quickly and easily. And uh, like I said, on the uh, false negative side, we, there's a similar thing called a hints file that we've added to help deal with uh, the, the false negatives. And m for most users, I've only known of like a couple of people that have even told me that they use a, a hints file on their own. Um, most of the time, it's just an issue back to the core project, and uh, we will resolve those usually pretty quickly. So let's talk about using dependency check. Um, the basic steps are just, you know, configuring the plugin. You know, uh, you may have to configure a proxy uh, or set up a NIST data mirror. If, you, if you're in an organization that's going to be doing a lot of this uh, analysis, I would highly recommend setting up a NIST data mirror. There's a Docker image. Uh, it's, a, it's a GitHub project, NIST data mirror. And there's actually a Docker image. It's really easy to set up um, to just keep a local copy of the NVD data. That'll save you uh, a lot of headaches uh, or could save you a lot of headaches depending on how, on how often scans are happening, et cetera. Uh, but you run your initial scan and then uh, analyze the HTML report, uh, create you know, and configure a suppression file if it's needed. Uh, sometimes you don't even need a suppression file, uh, especially sometimes on, on some Java projects because we've gone through and, and just included a lot of the common false positives already, uh, but they still absolutely come up. False positives are definitely do, do crop up and you, do need, and you will sometimes need to deal with them. 
And then the other most important thing is that you need to plan for and upgrade any identified vulnerable components. Um, of course, that is a, a risk-based decision for your organization. Um, however, I would say if it's an RCE remote code deserialization uh, de type issue, I would probably highly recommend prioritizing that patch. <laughs> Just uh, you know, uh, between friends here, uh, because once those CVs come out uh, for the remote code executions, they end up quickly being incorporated into almost script kitty level. Uh, attack tools. Yeah. So highly recommend if you see something come up, that's like an RCE patch quickly. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see about how much time do I have? Yeah. Um, uh, okay. So just very quickly, um, running dependency check. So um, I've already kind of run this a little bit, you know, but uh, dependency check is, uh, again, I've said, use the, the, uh, the plugins when possible. However, uh, this is a uh, Go project. Uh, so there isn't a build plugin. So we do kind of have to fall back and use the, the command line uh, tool. Um, but the command line tool, it has a lot of, uh, you know, options that can be selected. There's uh, actually a command completion, uh, a completion script that you can run on the command line to, to actually make uh, filling out all of those um, parameters uh, much, much easier. So like you can do enable and, and see the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the different options that you have. Um, so I could enable artifactory, not going to, but, but um, just out of the box, you can see like uh, some of the, sometimes the analysis goes very quick. If you have to do an up, if you have to do a full update of the NVD data, it could take a couple of minutes uh, to execute, depending on you know download speeds and, and whatnot. Uh, but it generally runs pretty quick. Um, sometimes on some of like your larger node or yarn projects, it might be a little bit slower, just because there are in those. Um, spaces, there are so many dependencies sometimes. Um, it's it's insane because you've got dependencies for a single line of code. Who knows, whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, and then once you run that tool, then you end up with the uh, dependency check report here. Uh, I could probably zoom in a little bit. If I can figure out how to do that on this keyboard, let me switch to this keyboard. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And uh, basically, it tells you, it gives you some great information up here at the bot at, at the top here. Uh, how to read this report? If you haven't used dependency check, highly recommend how to read the report. Suppressing false positives. Uh, even though I kind of covered it here, um, it's one of those areas that we get a lot of uh, questions on. And as you scroll down, <clears throat> by default, it just kind of highlights the uh, vulnerable dependencies here. Um, but you can click this little button to see all of the dependencies. Like some of these things, Burnt Sushi, there was no um, no vulnerability ID for Tomo identified. Uh, so, and, and then once again, this, this is a report that I have not um, gone through and done any analysis on the false positives, but I can guarantee um, I'm, I'm pretty positive the Docker Go units is not Docker Docker. So I could go down here to Go units and just say, you know what, this is a false positive. Click this button right here. And it pops up this little suppression that I can just hit Control C and copy um, and just paste that into a, into a text file and save it as a suppression file and use it for the next time that I run the analysis. And it'll be, um, you know, this false positive will no longer be reported. Uh, one of the one of the useful things is there's this little complete XML doc button here that if this is the first time you're creating the, the suppression file, you'll need to click that button because then it'll put all the headers and everything that you need um, into the suppression file for you. And then you can just uh, copy that and paste it into a text file um, and away you go. So that is kind of the very high level quick running the tool. 
Uh, let's see. So what are some of the uh, use cases for uh, dependency check? Um, hopefully you don't have to prove the existence of the problem within your, in your environment, but uh, we know there's a lot of places that, you know, you may not have an AppSec program or even an AppSec team and um, wish, wish you had uh, more support in the, in the security space, but uh, you can use this to prove the existence of the problem in your environment, in your application. Um, if you do find out that it's a problem and, and management might be open to buying a commercial solution, I always highly recommend using the, 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 the FOSS tools when you're doing a POC with the commercial uh, solutions, because if they're basically finding the same thing, um, that's something you might question the price tag that the commercial vendor is, is uh, asking. Um, and I've known people who have, have gotten a discount on things uh, because of that. Uh, I'm not saying it'll work every time, but I do know people who that has worked for them. Uh, many, a lot of organizations, the loss dependency check is their primary tool for software composition analysis. Uh, I also know that other, other companies may use dependency track. It's got a slightly different use case, uh, but does, but accomplishes the same, it, it, but accomplishes a similar goal. Um, and lastly, I know there are some companies that actually use multiple SCA tools. Uh, and that's because just like SAS tools, the SCA tools uh, will have almost a Venn diagram of their coverage. You will have um, a lot of commonality, but each of them will have their own little edge of the circle uh, of that Venn diagram of things that they find that the other tools don't. And part of that is um, what you're buying with a commercial vendor uh, with a commercial product is you are generally paying for their private database. Uh, so they you generally have access to vulnerabilities that uh, are not in the NVD and probably and may not even be in the OSS index because they've got um, security teams or uh, researchers finding these things. So uh, that's one of the things you, that, that you pay for with the companies and why some companies use multiple SCA tools, especially those that are shipping products to clients as opposed to just writing software that they you know, publish to AWS or, or, uh, or, or provide via a website or something like that. Uh, so that is kind of the, the uh, high level overview of dependency check and why you may wanna take a look at it if you haven't used it before. Um, lastly, uh, how you can help. We love pull requests. <laughs> uh, we've got 250 open issues, questions, enhancements, bugs. Uh, we've been talking about an enterprise deployment guide for a while, and we would love if you happen to be somebody who has successfully deployed um, dependency check within an enterprise, we'd love to get your feedback and uh, knowledge to help other organizations implement dependency check. Um, and the last major thing that, that we're looking for help with is the Gradle plugin needs to be rewritten, well, not rewritten, but reworked to use the worker API. It's just something we haven't had time to get into. Uh, we have a lot of great uh, help within the community. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark Han, Hans, uh, uh, Nicholas Humble, uh, all of the, we've had, we have a very small core team that's been doing a lot of great work, but as you can see, there's a lot of open issues and still a lot of work to make this tool even better. And we'd appreciate your help. Uh, with that, I think we're on to questions, which will be in the Slack uh, afterwards. <laughs>